I've just never done anything that's turned out to be valuable that wasn't just scared shitless to do it. Like everything I've ever done that's ever really made a contribution, I have felt alone in doing it mm -hmm. and afraid. And but alive. Yeah. That's a really interesting. Go, on, go tell me more about that. Alive. Alone but alive. That's that's sort of like the wilderness. It is the wilderness. Because you um, the metaphor for the book is let's see if I get this right. Yeah. Rather than asking you, I'm gonna try and you, yeah, you check do it. my work. Um, yeah, there's it's, it's it, there's a poetic narrative about it being wild and risky and you have to prepare to go there and it's it's, it's also stunning um, and so there's an obvious really clear connection between that and putting yourself out there yeah. there's risks and rewards and beauty um, but there's an interesting twist if if I get this right that it's not that you are in the wilderness it's that you are the wilderness explain that if you would well I think what I what I have found is that after the first time, and it only really takes one time, but after the first time that you opt to brave the wilderness, you pull away from what a group of people thinks. Maybe it's your, maybe it's your creative community, it's your critics. The first time you pull away and find power in standing on your own, I think your heart is marked by the wild. I think you belong in into the wilderness in a different way. Because every time after that, when you choose fitting in, over belonging to yourself, it's painful. I think there's like a thin film of terror wrapped around us. And so if it's not, I'm not safe enough, or I'm not secure enough, it's I'm not liked enough, I'm not promoted enough, I'm not loved enough. Scarcity, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I am not enough. At the very bottom, yeah. I'm not enough. Yeah. And Whoa, that's big, 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 big. Somebody ring some bells. <laughs> we need some bells to ring on this show. But that's no, good. that's it. And so guess what the number one casualty is of a scarcity culture? What? Vulnerability. We shut down. We shut down. Because I'm not going to let you know. No. Because I'm already I don't, scared. I'm not right. all together. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is that people are like, oh, well, we lose a little vulnerability. But vulnerability is not just about fear and grief and disappointment. It's the birthplace of everything we're hungry for. Creativity. Joy, creativity, yeah. faith, yeah. love. Innovation yeah. and all of that, yes. And the whole thing is there is no innovation and creativity without failure. Period. So you've got to be open enough to take the risk to fail. We think about vulnerability as a dark emotion. You know, there are a lot of people who talk about light emo you know, positive emotions, negative emotions, dark emotions, light emotions. We think of vulnerability as a dark emotion. We think of it as the core of fear and shame and grief and disappointment, uncertainty, things that we do not want to feel, right? Things that I don't want to be vulnerable because that means I'm afraid. That means I'm uncertain. That means I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm at risk. I'm exposed. I'm, I'm in grief. So what we do is we armor up and we say, I do not want to slip into these dark emotions. I will not let myself be vulnerable. But here's what I learned from the research and certainly put into motion in my own life that was the most life-changing is that vulnerability is the center of difficult emotion. But it's also the birthplace every positive emotion that we need in our lives. Love, belonging, joy, empathy. How many of you would agree that we're in a serious empathy deficit in our culture today? Totally, right? No vulnerability, no empathy. In a culture where people are afraid to be vulnerable, you can't have empathy. You know, empathy is not a default response. If you share something with me that's difficult, in order for me to be truly empathic, I have to step into what you're feeling. And that's vulnerable. So there can be no empathy without vulnerability. Um, why do you think, in that example that I used a while ago, daughter comes home and says, you know, tears. No one sat with me at lunch today. They made fun of what I was wearing. So-and-so won't talk to me. They poured my books out of my locker. And the response back is, I told you, I bought you all those cute jeans. Why aren't you wearing those jeans? And pull your hair back. 
Is that an empathic response? No, it's a shaming response. Could that shaming response be at the, could, could, could a mother who absolutely adores her child respond with that shaming response? Please say yes. Don't kid yourself. I mean, come on. If, you've got a, if you're a parent sitting in here, then you sure as hell know the answer to that is yes. Um, but why? Why did that happen? What, where was the access to vulnerability? Where was, I mean, where was empathy? You can't access empathy if you're not willing to be vulnerable. So if my daughter comes home and tells that to me, guess what I have to do? I have to reactivate that sweaty palmed seventh grader who lives inside me. And I have to go, oh God, that's so hard. I'm so sorry. That's happened to me. That's happened to me when I was in middle school and it's happened to me last week. Let's talk about it. But you can't get there without vulnerability. You can't fake empathy. Innovation and creativity, born of vulnerability. <laughs> um, this is my favorite part. I talked about this, and I did another TED Talk this year at, in Long Beach, and I told the story that during 2011 and even this year, um, after the big TEDx Houston talk went viral, the, the big calls came from Fortune 500 companies. Oh my God, we loved your TED talk. It was great. Please come talk to all of our senior leaders. And it's like, okay, um, what do you want to talk about? Like, we don't care. Just come and talk to us. Just um, if you could ixnay the shame and vulnerability talk. <laughs> Every single conversation, barring maybe 10%. I said, like, well, what do you mean? Well, we you know, you're, you know, you're funny. You have this great research. I think there's a real fit with what we do. We just, we don't really do, you know, that kind of stuff around here. So you, if you could not mention vulnerability and shame. <laughs> so just for fun, for grins, I would say, okay, so what would you like me to talk about? Yeah, fourth quarter earnings, like, <laughs> freaking don't even balance my checkbook. Um, <laughs> like, I'm not going to talk about that. So... What do, you, what, do you want, what do you want me to talk about? Well, the big issue, creativity and innovation. Mm. And change. We're going through a lot of change. <laughs> like, okay, so vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity, innovation, change. And the reason that crisis is happening is because you're not talking about vulnerability. Imagine creativity and innovation without vulnerability. I'm asking you, for a work product that has never been made before, that's completely innovative, I need you to be creative, and I need you to present it to a group of people who are gonna, half of them are gonna think it's stupid and not understand it. No vulnerability there. How many of you struggle with perfectionism a little bit? Okay, so my favorite story is that someone sent me an email one time that said, hey, I know you have a book on shame, not so interested in that, but when, if you ever write on perfectionism, I can't wait. <laughs> so here's the, here's the secret. When perfectionism is driving, shame is always riding shotgun. And fear is the annoying backseat driver. Say it again. When, when perfectionism is driving, shame is always riding shotgun. We struggle with perfectionism in areas where we feel most vulnerable to shame. Does that make sense? So we're all comfortable saying, yeah, I'm a little perfectionistic, which is code for like, I do things really well. Um, <laughs> But I don't really, I'm not comfortable saying I have shame. But perfectionism, what is that? I call it the 20-ton shield. Here's what perfectionism really is. It's a way of thinking that says this. If I look perfect, live perfect, work perfect, I can avoid or minimize criticism, blame, and ridicule. Whoa, that's good. All perfectionism is, is the 20-ton shield that we carry around hoping that it'll keep us from being hurt. When in truth, what it does is it keeps us from being seen. And so we had a great talk about yes. what's the difference between perfectionism. Yes, because somebody on my staff had the nerve to tell me that I was a perfectionist. And I absolutely deny that. And you stood by me. Thank you very much. Because I'm not a perfectionist. I'm a person who strives for excellence and requires excellence. There, there is a difference, is there not? There is a difference. Here's difference. the difference. Because sometimes I'm a healthy striver. Yeah. And sometimes I'm a perfectionist. It depends on if I'm feeling, if I've got a worthiness crunch going yeah. on. 
So healthy striving is internally focused. It's I want to do this and be the best I can be. Perfectionism is not about what I want. It's perfectionism is exactly what will people think. think. Yes. Because when I talk, when I do a lot of leadership work, I talk about understanding your personal values, and my two personal values are faith and courage. And so they say, don't talk about faith. It's inappropriate. It's, this is a you know an organ, a corporate a corporation. And then a lot, I do a lot of work in churches, and they'll say, don't cuss. And so I just got to the point where I'm like, look, I've sat across from thousands and thousands of people over the last two decades of my life listening to the hardest things you can imagine. And the two things that everyone has in common when they're talking about those things are cussing and praying. If you don't want me to cuss and you don't want me to pray, that's awesome. Ask somebody else. Because what I'm not going to do is get up and bullshit you. And there are a million people in this space who, who are better than I am, who know different things than I do. Invite them. Right. If you need me to wear a suit, um, that's, I, I totally get it. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to wear jeans and boots and probably I'll wear a nice shirt. Yep. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I don't get up there when I speak in public, I don't get up there to talk to my, you know, to talk from my Brooks brother self to your Brooks brother self. I get up there and when I walk on the stage, I'm going to talk about things that 90% of the people in the audience have never thought about talked about and are scared to listen to and they need to see me as a person and I'm just that person. Yeah. I think the clear I want if you invite me, I want your event or your leadership team. I want it to be successful. Yes. You know, and if you need me to be someone different than who I am, it's not going to be successful. Yeah.